Inside all of us beats the heart of a ferocious beast, a raging tidal wave war cry that resonates throughout our very beings and shakes our cores time and time again when it's needed most. You out there watching are so immensely strong with this power that it activates without you even knowing that it'll give you godlike strength. I'm talking about survival instinct. And while it varies wildly from person to person, survival instinct is responsible for some of the most incredible feats of human strength. From outrunning attacking predators twice your size, to lifting cars off of your trapped underneath children because you really want to make damn sure that your genetic material survives to further your legacy. The vast majority of people on this planet have a built-in toggle switch that removes any and all extraneous thought and function from the equation and crash courses your body into solve this one problem right the fuck now mode. But sometimes that's not good enough. Sometimes you die and there's not a damn thing you could have done about it. Or even more hilariously, you could have done a thing or two about it, but you didn't and now you look mighty foolish. Welcome back to my series on Wikipedia's incredible article, The List of Unusual Deaths. This is probably probably the most exciting entry we've done yet because we are now finally smack dab right in the middle of the 20th century. We have face planted square into the part of the chart that's got actual first hand evidence pictures, video, credible articles and text, you name it, we finally have it. All these are pretty much completely proven to have happened and that makes them all the more fucked up. Enjoy! First up is the death of my integrity because this video is sponsored by Displate. Displate is a huge collection of posters that you can hang on the wall that's going to show everyone in a seven mile radius that you're into the goofy stuff that keeps you up at night. And when I say seven mile radius, I mean it because these things are made out of metal. So they'll shine like a bright star of geeky obsessiveness that'll really communicate to your parents that there's a reason you still don't have a girlfriend. That box I was holding up earlier is also a really handy dandy way to keep them packed economically. It's a fancy space age cardboard technology that holds your posters in it really conveniently. God damn it. Holds your posters in it really conveniently. So I ordered five disc plates of my own. I got some from Doom, as you saw. I got some from Batman. I tried to get ones from my different interests. And most importantly, I got one of Ty Lee from Avatar The Last Airbender. The best character from Avatar The Last Airbender. No, I won't elaborate. I left the plastic film on mine that it comes with so it'll stay even extra more shiny and that it'll stay preserved long after I die. But if you have to crack it open, they come with a really, really simple magnetic mounting system inside. So there's no need to drill holes in your walls like in my real house right here. Watch how easy it is to mount it. Boom. That was easy. Click the link in the description or use discount code HUGBEES and you'll get an incremental discount based on how many you order up to 40% off. That'll let you buy a lot of industrial sheets of introverted illustrations. Each one, zoom in, enhance, is also hand signed by the master of production to ensure high quality. And there's over a million designs to pick from, including things that you know and recognize like The Witcher, Elden Ring, Star Wars, Marvel, the brand new Cyberpunk 2077 collection to celebrate Collector's Fest, and Avatar The Last Airbenders featuring Ty Lee and some other characters no one cares about. They're also eco-friendly because each purchase of a plate results in a planted tree. And that's because they're made of metal. You don't need a tree to make one of these, you stupid f Click the link in the description or use code HUGBEES to get a discount applied to your order at Displate. The more that you order, the more you save up to 40% off. Displate, the best way to very slowly add an extra 400 pounds to your house until your support beams eventually collapse. 
Hi, welcome to my desk. Forgive the profuse sweating, it's Florida summer and I'm absolutely fucked. R. Stanton Walker was a 19-year-old guy from Morristown, Ohio, who liked doing regular guy things in the early 1900s. We'll just call him Stanton because initials are for old people and calling dead people Walker is reserved for zombie television shows that absolutely outstate their welcome. While taking a break from losing one of his fingers to a newfangled mass production assembly line, Stanton was hanging outside with a hand full of his friends. I just realized that handful is probably in poor taste thanks to youth labor conditions of the era, so it was more likely a stump full of his friends. Anyway, Stanton was a fairly typical youth of the era and completely contrasted to the youth of today. He actually liked going outside. What a weirdo. But it was probably because his home's backyard backed right up to a baseball diamond. After constructing a rudimentary bench out of fence posts, Stanton and his friends were able to take a seat and watch games for free. Stanton's friend who was sitting on his left was keeping score on a notepad, presumably because Ohio had just invented numbers a year prior, when his pencil became too dull to write with. His friend said, Ah, gee whiz, fellas, I put on my finest glad rags and saw a man about a dog expecting a real bash for some Zazzled boys like us at the old ball game, but my pencil's a gas. Now my meat hook's got nothing to keep this hanging time going. Nothing's Jake out here today, I tells ya. Those are all real 1900 slang terms, by the way, if you want to figure out what the fuck I just said, but the point is, he mentioned his pencil was dull and he couldn't keep score anymore. Then Stanton's friend, sitting on his right, replied, Hey dude, don't worry about it, you silly little bitch. I just so happened to have brought my trusty stabbing knife with me to the game. You know, in case anyone needs stabbing. But you can use it to sharpen the edges of a pencil, I guess. I've never seen a stabbing knife do that. Just, just don't dull the edge. I plan to do some stabbing later. Stanton's friend with the knife began to pass it to his friend with the pencil, but at just that moment, a foul ball from the baseball game collided into the boys, smashing the knife directly into Stanton's chest. At first, Stanton's friend cried, Hot dog! That old stab a knife still does the trick! And then he leaned down to give it a good little kiss on the handle. But then he asked Stanton if it was hurt. And Stanton replied, and this is an exact quote, Not much. Which leaves me questioning if this guy is my grandfather, because that's exactly what I would respond if someone dared to question if I could handle a little stabbing or two directly into my chest. Stanton couldn't handle it, though. The knife passed between his ribs and shredded up his arteries real good, causing him to bleed out within minutes. Or at least that's the reported story. I read a lot of articles on this guy's death intricately, and I think there's a huge detail that most reports omit. I'm willing to bet that Stanton died of boredom because he was watching baseball. Oh my God, kill me. Now we don't know this next guy's exact identity, probably because of privacy reasons, but we do know that he was Hawaiian, which means he was either harboring a blue space alien in his home that he passed off as a dog, or he spent his days laughing at the shockingly large number of homeless people trapped with him on a makeshift island prison. Probably both. In either case, we'll call him Hawaiian man for simplicity. Hawaiian man was afflicted by a condition that happens to, oh, all of us from time to time, it's as common as the common cold. He was possessed by a demon. Well, he was actually suffering from malaria, but he and his family, all highly religious people, thought he had some sort of devil living in him and butt fucking his organs. So they said the motto that all Christian families say when things get tough. Your face, your ass, what's the difference? Nope, oh, nope, that's... That's the wrong Duke Nukem quote. What they actually said was, let God sort him out. So they called a local kahuna to treat him of his afflictions. Now here's a fun little fact I didn't know before I started this video. The term kahuna actually refers to a specialist in a field of study. Now typically it refers to healers such as doctors, dentists, ministers, and priests, but realistically, synonyms for the term could be master, virtuoso, or hugbies. Now the point I'm making with that factoid, besides brightening up your day with knowledge, is the kahuna the family called in to treat the malaria-ridden Hawaiian wasn't necessarily a priest or a doctor. He could have been a big kahuna and beating the absolute 
absolute shit out of people, because that's apparently what he came there to do. The malaria-ridden Hawaiian man was beaten to death with a Bible by the kahuna in a religious ceremony designed to banish the demons from his body. To give the family some credit, this did cure his malaria, because it's hard to have malaria when you're dead. The kahuna was arrested and charged with manslaughter, and to give my two cents on the whole thing, I think this is just another case of the cops ruining everything. Because I'll bet that if the kahuna gave that man another swift kick or two in the ribs, he would have risen like Jesus Christ thanks to the healing power of God's violence. Don't take my word for it, it's right there in the Bible. Ezekiel 2320. If thy neighbor shakes and sweats with an affliction of the body, thou shalt whoopest thine ass with holy fervor until thy neighbor stops acting like ye old bitch. Dietrich von Holsen Hessler, which is definitely mispronounced, I don't care, was a general of the good old-fashioned German Empire. And thankfully not the really nasty blacklisted modern German Empire. This is World War I here, folks, not World War II, so we're totally in the clear to talk about all of this. Back in November of 1908, the Kaiser of Germany, Wilhelm II, got a fancy schmancy hunting trip together for him and his bestest boys. They all crammed together in a cabinet Donna Hushingen Don Donna Hot Don Castle <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, I also just swore in German there. The large assembly of men did what all men do at sleepovers. Immediately took off their shirts to rub each other's pecs so that they could practice fondling boobs and build up their stamina for when they finally get girlfriends. Now, I really can't wait to see the comments on this video because they will back me up. There is going to be a large amount of ladies that are completely in disbelief over this fact, but is a hundred thousand percent true this is what happens at 98 percent of guys sleepovers i'm serious ask your boyfriend your brother even your dad. When taking a break from subclavius style shoulder rubs and regular rub and tugs, Dietrich decided it was time to surprise his lovely friends with an incredible and flamboyant performance. Oh boys, Dietrich cried out before he revealed himself dressed in a pink tutu with a rose wreath. Now, remember, this is a party for the grand leader of Germany and all his closest allies, and out strolls one of their colleagues who was a high ranking military officer dressed in a women's ballerina outfit. So of course, they immediately went ballistic and cheered him on with thunderous applause. Dietrich launched into a shockingly well choreographed and rehearsed ballet routine, including pirouettes, flirtatious kisses, and getting his period right there in the middle of the stage. Once the dance was over, the audience erupted with applause and you go girls. Dietrich, finally happy for the first time in his life, took a bow and fucking died. Turns out that the exertion of the dance most likely combined with the sudden movement of the bow, and his body just gave out on him. He immediately collapsed onto the stage, and then after being attended to by a few doctors in the audience, was declared to have been dead immediately. Everyone was silent. Everyone looked around the room. Until Kaiser Wilhelm II said, Whoa! Hey, whoa, guys. This, uh... This looks gay. This looks really gay. Oh, wow, I didn't realize it, but like, people are gonna think we're gay. We gotta cover this up and also stop jacking each other off when our hands get tired just to help a bro out immediately. No, I'm not fucking kidding. I make a lot of jokes in my videos, yes, but I'm not kidding about any of this. General of Infantry Dietrich von Holsenhausler's death was completely covered up by the German military because they were all worried that everyone would think they were super gay if they found out what happened. Now sure, this is probably something the vast majority of men would want to avoid being called in 1908 Germany because, you know, the early 1900s in Germany weren't exactly the most tolerant places on Earth, but it was compounded by the Eulenburg Affair. 
And there's a lot of history to the Eulenburg Affair, but I think it's best summarized by me just reading the opening line to its Wikipedia article verbatim. The Eulenburg Affair, described as the biggest homosexual scandal ever, was a public controversy surrounding a series of court martials and five civil trials regarding accusations of homosexual conduct and accompanying libel trials among prominent members of Kaiser Wilhelm II's cabinet and all entourage during 1907 to 1909. That's pretty fucking good. That death right there is a star example of why I make these videos. It's pretty good. But what's that? You want a little humorous cherry on top of your funny facts Sunday to really drive in the irony? Okay. Okay, fine. Dietrich was the military officer appointed with covering up the Eulenburg affair. So I guess the moral of the story is, don't be gay. No, no, that's, no, that's not right. Let me try that again. Don't be German. No, that's bad too. Uh, don't be gay and German. Yeah, that's fine. All right, this one's a pretty silly story that I know for a fact I thankfully will never fall prey to because it involves denying the kisses of multiple women desperate for affection, something I readily have to accept every single day. George Spencer Millet was a handsome young lad with an even more handsome newspaper headline written about his death. Stabbed to death in office frolic. And now to keep reading the story behind that headline to get more info, which totally won't turn out super dark and make me question just how morbid the humor of this series is. 15-year-old boy struggling with girl stenographers killed on birthday. Ah, well, uh, everyone knows the 1900s was the peak era of child death related comedy thanks to the breakout success of the world's first talking motion picture entitled Small Boy Goes Wee Hee Hee and Then Explodes, so let's just keep talking about it, shall we? George worked as an office boy at an insurance company in downtown New York City. An office boy is basically an intern or a temp. You do all the bitch work and instead of thanks, you're given a fat, warm loogie hawked in your face by your superiors. On George's 15th birthday, the girl stenographers of the company, which that's what they were actually called, their job description was girl stenographer, threatened George with a barrage of kisses once the workday had ended, specifically planning to give him one kiss for every year he was alive. Now, if you take 15 kisses and you multiply it by the six, six women working there, by my math, that's about over 100 million kisses. Who the fuck has time for that many kisses? I would have hightailed it out of there too. Once the workday had ended, the girls pounced on George like a cougar, except not nearly as old. And George bolted to try to avoid the incoming avalanche of blatant sex crimes that everyone was just kind of cool with back then. While doing his best to cast doubt on his heterosexuality, George tripped over and landed on the ink eraser in his pocket, where he then started shouting, I'm stabbed, I'm stabbed. A lot of you watching right now are probably picturing one of these babies. And you're probably thinking, wow, he must have fell really fucking hard to get stabbed by one of those, or holy shit, what a wimpy little baby man. How did that possibly kill him? And oh yeah, I'm gonna beat Cell at those Cell games, cause I'm the champ. Who's this Goku fella? Well, that's because you're thinking of the wrong eraser. This is a vintage ink eraser that we're gonna be talking about that looks like this. You'd basically scrape the ink directly off the page with one of these bad boys, and they also make for a great object to desperately reach for when you're in the middle of a scuffle on the office floor, because you really need to jab out Mike's eye from accounting, because you really need him dead to be able to steal all those office birthday kisses for yourself. 23-year-old Gertrude Robbins was one of those mwah, mwah, mwah masochists chasing after George, and she was the one to break through the pack to try to aid him as she saw something was wrong. Wrong. But upon flipping him over and seeing the blood pour from his chest, she fainted and just created more dead weight for the arriving ambulance to deal with. Thanks a lot, Gertrude, you dumb bitch. But Gertrude thankfully got what she deserved because she was charged with manslaughter. But after explaining what happened and being backed up by all the other gushing Gina witnesses, she was released. It was a bit of a fuck up by the police in my opinion, because I think she should have at least gotten two death penalties for inconveniencing them, but that's just my journalistic opinion. There is a happy ending to all of this though. George was buried with what may be one of the coolest headstones in the world. 
lost life by stab in falling on ink eraser, evading six young women trying to give him birthday kisses in office metropolitan life building. God, that's so cool. If you don't think that's cool, what's your headstone going to say, huh? Loving person and dead friend, dining comfort of those closest to them will be dearly missed. Blah, 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 blah. Fuck you, you pussy. Why don't you accomplish something by doing what you and George never got to do in your lifetime? Try getting laid for once. Doc Powers wasn't your local superhero. He was a major league baseball player, which makes him a local superhero to children who care about baseball, not nearly as interesting as any football or basketball, player to the average American, but whatever. His nickname Doc wasn't a juxtaposition of his skills on the baseball field, however. He was an actual licensed doctor, which makes it all the more ironic that he died in the middle of doing the other thing that he was super skilled at and didn't use his original skill intensive training to save himself. This dumb bastard died while in the middle of playing a professional baseball game and couldn't even save himself by playing doctor. Accounts vary on how Powers lost all power to keep his body alive. Live. And this is because this story happened over a century ago when we didn't have the internet to make up a thousand different theories and claim all of them as factually accurate. Instead, we have three different accounts recording what happened that began his death spiral into... Well, death. The first one says that while diving for a ball, Powers hit the ground wrong and hurt himself. Another person claimed that while chasing a foul ball, he ran into a wall and, again, hurt himself. But the third theory, which is the one that Powers himself commented he thought was the cause of his subsequent medical issues and is the funniest, is that before the game, he had several cheese sandwiches that caused significant food poisoning. And I'd trust him if I were you, he was a doctor. But he was also trained under century-old medical knowledge, so he was also a fucking idiot. Whatever it was that caused it, during the seventh inning, Powers began suffering severe stomach cramps and gastritis. Being huge strongman with Big Wiener, Powers stuck it out to finish up the game, and then almost collapsed once it ended, before being escorted off the field by medical personnel to be shipped off to Northwest General Hospital. Doctors at the hospital who were, again, fucking morons thanks to their lacking of god knows how many thousands of medical advancements we've made in the last hundred years, said that Powers would most likely ride out the pain in the next couple of days and be ready to play again later that week. Nah, they were wrong. When surgeons were given the green light to finally poke at him willy-nilly without worrying about killing him, the slice and dice doctors found the actual problem. His intestines had begun to gangrene. So they cut those little fuckers out, sewed them back up, patted him on the back and said, all right, Doc Powers, you're good to go. Be sure to meet your wife, Nurse Steele, out in the lobby. But Doc Powers never did get to have that godlike Adonis-style sex with his turbo wife, because he didn't get better. He went through two more surgeries on his tummy, but they did not nothing, and Doc Powers died shortly after the third. His final words were reported to be, I've got no pulse, no pulse, which was promptly followed up by someone asking him, then how are you still alive, genius? And then Doc Powers got up and slapped him across the face and replied, because I'm a doctor, you idiot. The human body can survive for minutes after the heart stops beating, and I'm able to properly take my own pulse thanks to my medical training. Now would you please shut the hell up? I've only got a few minutes left, but and thus ended the life of an all-time great baseball player. Or a really shitty one. I'll be honest, I have no idea. Here's his stats on the screen from the MLB archives, and I don't have any idea what any of these numbers mean. If any of you baseball nerds watching in the comments want to let me know how this guy fared for a player of his decade, I'm really curious if him being a doctor meant he could hit balls with surgical precision, or if he was worthless like a dermatologist. Next on the list is Franz Reichelt, and I made a whole full entire length video on that guy because when you tell the story about a man trying to invent Batman's bat suit in the early 1900s, it's as tragic and hilarious as you'd expect it to be. I'm gonna go ahead and put that down in the description, and I want you to watch it, and you will because you're my best friend and all, which means you'd do anything for me, right? <laughs> Oh, hey, speaking of being my best friend, why weren't you at my wedding? Ra Ra Rasputin, lover of the Russian queen. They put some poison into his wine. Ra Ra Rasputin, Russia's greatest love machine. He drank it all and said, 
I feel fine. Ra Ra Rasputin, lover of the Russian queen. They didn't quit, they wanted his head. Ra Ra Rasputin, Russia's greatest love machine. And so they shot him until he was dead. It's a bit unfair for me to have to describe the death of Grigory Rasputin to you, because I'd wager that this is the most well-known death on this entire list ever. This entire series, this is probably the most well-known. After all, we wouldn't have a 1978 Eurodance multinational hit about this guy and his untimely demise if it wasn't such a famous story. So to compromise, I'll just keep this one brief, because I already spun off another entry into its own video, and god damn it, if I had to do one for Rasputin, it would probably be like three hours long, and I'm really busy. Rasputin was a good old-fashioned mystic healer who used his wily tricks to get in good graces with the the emperors of Russia, Tsar Nicholas II and Tsarina Alexandra. Over time, he used his incredible charisma to become highly influential in the world of Russian politics. Now, the impressive part is he managed to do that while maintaining a highly scandalized lifestyle full of tons of debaucherous claims. People said he was making power moves throughout the royal family, which shocked the Russian aristocracy. People said his odd spiritual teachings directly counter-opposed the Russian Orthodox Church, which shock the Russian Orthodox Church, and at the time they were really powerful. So the noblemen of Russia at the time came up with a plan, and it could be summarized in the wise words of Curtis 50 Cent Jackson as featured in the game 50 Cent Blood on the Sand. Let's waste this motherfucker. By the way, if you want to watch me play 50 Cent Blood on the Sand and other delightful games, you can check out my gaming channel, Hugby's Gamer Mode. The link's in the description. It was time to kill Rasputin, because just like Monica Lewinsky, he was too good at sucking and fucking his way to the top. Here's where things get interesting enough to write an insatiably catchy chorus to. Now here's what we do know about Rasputin's assassination. Rasputin died in the home of Prince Felix Yusupov in December of 1916. He was killed in a plot concocted by Vladimir Pereshkovich, Grand Duke Dmitry Pavlovich, and Prince Felix Yusupov. He was shot three times, one of which was square in the middle of his forehead. And that's all we know. But Hugbees, you're probably screaming as you wipe hot pocket grease off your second chin. What about all the other stuff? There's tons of funny stories and content based around just how fucked up the assassination of Rasputin was. Well, from this point, we actually don't have any definitive proof of what exactly happened. It's all word of mouth from the people involved in the assassination, and who the fuck knows what they made up for propaganda, what fuck ups on their part they covered up, or how many details they left out. The most common narrative of this entire debacle is the story written in Yusupov's memoirs that basically goes like this. Yusupov invited Rasputin to his home in order to meet his wife, Irina. Now, Irina was actually away at the time, proving Yusupov to be the lying bastard we all expect him to be. While playing Super Smash Bros. Melee on Yusupov's actual not-emulated GameCube, Rasputin got a little frustrated that he had to use the second-player controller that had a loose analog stick and a slightly defective arm shoulder button. To calm Rasputin's saltiness down, Yusupov offered him a plate of cakes. Rasputin began scarfing the cakes down to quell his type Z diabetes, which is diabetes so severe it hadn't been invented yet. As Rasputin horfed down the food, he said, Hey Yusupov, these cakes are delicious. What's in them? Yusupov said, uh, let's see, sugar, butter, eggs, vanilla, potassium cyanide, flour, baking powder, milk, and... Oh, my secret ingredient, a little bit of cinnamon. Rasputin immediately froze while choking on a piece of cake. He said, Did you just say these have what I think you said in them? This cake has cinnamon in it? I'm deadly allergic to cinnamon. But it was too late. He was dead. Not from the cinnamon, that'd be fucking stupid. The cyanide killed him. When suddenly Rasputin shot back up and said, Oh, God, I'm so sorry about that. I think I entered diabetic shock. I'm. Totally fine, though. Got my EpiPen jabbed into my thigh, and what were we doing? I passed out, and <gasps> cakes! <laughs> Much to Yusupov's astonishment, Rasputin was totally unaffected by the cyanide. Now Yusupov was totally freaking out, and he said, oh, <laughs> Hey, uh, hey, Rasputin, I'm, a, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I have to check. I have to check that my gun is still loaded. You know, just in case. Uh, feel free to finish off those cakes. Yusupov ran into the other room where some other co-conspirators were waiting. And he said, guys, I'm freaking out. He ate 
all of the poison cakes and three glasses of wine, and he's not dead. And one of the conspirators rightly asked, well, why'd you bother to tell us that he had three glasses of wine? And Yusupov replied, because I put cyanide in that too. What the fuck? I don't have time for this. I have hockey practice later. Someone get me my gun. About 12 different assassination model guns were hurled at Yusupov. So he grabbed a revolver, went back and shot Rasputin multiple times. As the smoking wounds of the fresh 7.62 caliber bullet singed the mystic's flesh, Rasputin turned around and said with little cake in his beard, Hey, Yusupov, do you have a, like, a swarm of Russian mosquitoes or something in here? Like, my back and chest just got really super itchy in three different places at the same time. Nothing. Nothing at all. Rasputin was unaffected. Yusupov wrote this direct quote in his memoir. This devil who was dying of poison, who had a bullet in his heart, must have been raised from the dead by the powers of evil. There was something appalling and monstrous in his diabolic refusal to die. Now at this point, things were getting a little too fishy for Rasputin. He took a closer look at the cakes he'd been noshing into for the last three hours, and after eyeing one suspiciously, he muttered, Hey, wait a minute. These cakes have sugar in them! I'm diabetic, are you trying to kill me? Rasputin leapt up at Yusupov in a rage, and once he made it outside, he instantly suffered PTSD when he remembered Yusupov was an obnoxious ice climber's mane, so he collapsed into the snow. Yusupov and the other conspirators looked at him, shrugged their shoulders, wrapped him up in a cloth, and threw him in the My Mal the Malya Nevka River. That one. Good job, well done. And that's the totally true story of how Rasputin died. Or is it? Now we have to do what modern science does every single day. We have to ruin the fun of everything. Modern autopsies of Rasputin's body in 2016, which were commissioned to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the event, basically said that none of that shit happened and it's all made up and unicorns aren't real and you can go home now. There was no evidence of his corpse drowning or having poison in it. And in terms of gunshots, the only one they found was a single wound going straight through his forehead. I mean, you can even confirm it yourself if you play amateur detective and just look at the photo of his body. Now I'm not gonna show the photo of Rasputin's corpse in this video because, and I can't repeat myself enough here, this website has transformed into a soft and squishy parasocial machine designed to distract Zoomers from the fact that they're all socially anxious at all times instead of being an actual website for historical and educational content. But if you look the photo up for yourself, you can see the bullet wound clear as day in the middle of his forehead. And there's weight to that new information, because it really doesn't make sense for a dude to get up and attack his assassin after he'd been shot point blank in the middle of the forehead. There's also the fact that in 1929, Rasputin's daughter said her father notoriously hated sweets, so him eating a bunch of poison cakes would be really unusual, and this story was all most likely invented to paint him as a more blasphemous, death-defying figure to help Yusupov increase reputation and sales of his memoirs. But there is a caveat to all of this and I must mention, the entirety of Rasputin's death is under historical scrutiny and debate. I am not making any claims here. But from the evidence I found, I believe that unfortunately the tale that makes for a great musical hook doesn't make for a factually accurate retelling. Rasputin was probably just blindsided by someone with a gun and unceremoniously told to fuck off via an entry and exit wound. I can't really know for sure, but I'm going to continue to be my boring, skeptical ass self and say all the poisoning and other James Bond nonsense was an embellishment of a relatively tame political move. But what do you think happened? Let me know in the the comments below and I'll probably do absolutely nothing about it. Don't you love when creators with millions of fans tell people to leave comments because they're totally gonna read them? As if they have time to scroll through thousands and thousands of messages a day? I'm the only person on this platform that's gonna tell it to you straight, folks. Leave comments on my videos so I get more engagement and I'm pushed harder in the algorithm, and in exchange, you'll have a good chance of having your comment voted up to the top so people can see it when they check out the video or when I check on the video's performance for from time to time. There, I'm being honest with you, and you're helping me. Everyone wins, and we're not living in the disgusting parasocial engagement land that this website wants to be. Mutual respect. Moving on. Oh boy!
play more floods. I really hate to pull a Simpsons and have done everything ever before anyone else thought of doing it, but this entry is not going to be the first time I covered an unconventional flood that took people to Valhalla. The first one would be the London Beer Flood of 1814, and the unusual deaths playlist is in the description. Just watch my other videos. You like this? You'll like all of them. I'm, I'm always this good, yes. The Great Molasses Flood, on the other hand, happened over a hundred years later and was given the nickname the Boston Molasses Disaster, which will be the name of my math rock band within the next decade, mark my fucking words. At the Purity Distilling Company in Boston, there was a magical little molasses tank that could. It dispensed molasses to ships on the harbor, and everyone was happy. This little tank was also 50 feet tall and 90 feet in diameter, so for a happy little tank, it was a bit of a huge bitch. On January 16th, 1919, the Earth was beginning to do that weird fucking thing that it's been doing for the last few years. You know that thing where our temperatures are getting all out of whack and we're all gonna die super soon from it? That thing. The normally cold winter air was disrupted by a sudden, uncharacteristic heat wave. Again, I know this is normal stuff in this day and age, but back then this was weird, I assure you. Those temperature shifts caused the molasses to experience fermentation and thermal expansion. And at around 12.30 p.m., it utilized the second attack found on Rare Hollow Fortress from the Pokemon trading card game Heart Gold and Soul Silver Undaunted Expansion. Everyone exploded now. As torpedo explosions tend to do for parts of the ocean, a 25-foot tidal wave of molasses began to sail throughout Boston. Already this is pretty fucking scary, seeing as it was three feet taller than the London Beer Flood. But molasses is pretty dang thick, so this shit was gonna cause a hell of a lot more trouble. I mean, what would you prefer to have cruise through your town at 35 miles per hour? Something you could reasonably swim in, or something that would basically trap you and smother you to death? Flooding in certain areas was as deep as two feet, and people as well as entire horses were swallowed up in this stuff like, according to the Boston Post, many flies on sticky wallpaper. Oh, and this was still winter, mind you. Temperatures may have gotten a bit silly for a while, but overall the cold outside was claiming back its seasonal throne. This meant the molasses was super quick to cool down, meaning people were just flat out trapped inside of the stuff. You know when you melt cheese on food and then later all that cheese cools down and it gets all solid and not nearly as neat and gooey and fascinating? Imagine you're trapped in that, except it's way stickier, and you know what? You guys know what molasses is, this analogy is really stupid. 21 people died, over 150 were injured, and a good handful of horses were just flat out obliterated. And Betty Crocker herself publicly screamed FUCK on national news when she was told that her newest production line of ginger snaps was going to be on hold for a while. The carnage was so ridiculous that rescue workers searched for four days for survivors, and said that most of the dead were just kind of left to sit in the sugar because excavating them wasn't worth the time. Personally, I wouldn't have pulled any dead people out of the wreckage because that's one hell of an earth-friendly casket. I mean, it feeds the children with a yummy treat and you can just put it straight in the ground for the worms and the rats problem. Some people were also blown out in the Boston Harbor by the initial explosion, and they weren't found until months after the incident. One man was blown all the way to New Hampshire by the blast, where he promptly said, oh god, anywhere but here, and then promptly died of boredom. Purity distilling was swamped with a PR disaster. Ha, <laughs> clever pun. They were now facing a humongous class action lawsuit against them for the damage. Their incredible defense at the time was... <laughs> Anarchists blew up our tank. <laughs> oh my god, how could they have done this? Those damn anarchists. <laughs> yeah, right. I'll believe that as soon as I believe Andy the Goose was murdered by Satanists. They were ordered to pay almost $700,000 in damages, which according to an inflation calculator is about $12.5 million today. And that's a pretty penny. It's almost half of what I make in my third bank account that I had to open because I maxed out the other two. I mean, that's a pretty sort of large sum. Alexander of Greece died while playing with macaque. Seriously. 
Alexander was king of Greece in the late 1910s. He was hanging around the royal estate, walking his German shepherd, when suddenly, like a wild Pokemon battle, Macaque jumped out of the bushes and began attacking the dog. Alexander, a skilled trainer with eight gym badges, knew to immediately rush in and separate the animals. While that was happening, a second scuffle occurred with Macaque, who ran into the scene and bit Alexander on the leg, proving that it's not just Macaque you have to worry about, but the friends of Macaque as well. The leg wound got infected, and he died. If I had known Macaque carried deadly bacteria, I would have done something about it, but personally I think Macaque is perfect the way it is. And pretty damn cute at that. I hope that everyone gets to play with Macaque one day. Oh my god, Macaque sounds like penis! It's a monkey! Duh! Frank Hayes is the greatest athlete who has ever lived, and I stand by that claim. Fuck you, LeBron James. Suck my dick, Michael Jordan. Eat my ass, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Big fuck yous to Wayne Gretzky, Michael Phelps, Babe Ruth, Muhammad Ali, Jesse Owens, Mike Tyson, and anyone else you can think of who ranks among the greatest of the greats in their sport. Frank Hayes did something none of them have ever achieved and most likely never will. Frank was a horse jockey who was a terrible horse jockey. He was actually primarily a stable hand who dabbled in being a jockey every now and then, but he never won a single race. He intended to change that with this upcoming race in New York. By God did he intend to change that, and nothing, not even his own death, would stop him. Frank was entered into a race on a horse named Sweet Kiss that was also kind of a dumpy loser like he was. The odds for that horse winning were placed at 20 to one. The race went off and Frank, perhaps bolstered by pity from an otherwise uncaring god, won decisively. The crowd went ballistic, but Frank didn't seem to give a shit. In fact, he seemed completely worn out from pushing himself so hard during the run. In fact, he seemed dead. In fact, he was dead. A doctor estimated that he suffered a heart attack during the race and died at some point before the finish line. This made him the first and only jockey to have won a race while dead, and that makes him the greatest athlete of all time ever. This man was able to win a sport using absolutely 0% effort. He wasn't just lackadaisically cashing in a victory like many athletes when they're playing below their skill level, this man was so non-existent on the racetrack that he didn't even take oxygen away from the wind resistance through his own respiration and yet still won the gold medal. Show me another athlete who's done that. I dare you. You can't. Yes, we know the story of Arachion, the Greek wrestler who died while winning a match, but his opponent had already chosen to concede before he was killed. Oh, and the horse? It was nicknamed Sweet Kiss of Death for the rest of its life. Presumably after the race was done and it was retired to the stables, it pulled out a little horse walkie-talkie from out under its mane and said, the job's done. I want my money. 20 to 1 odds on a million bucks should mean a pretty payday for me. Okay. It's creepypasta time. There isn't all that much written about this one beyond the original newspaper article and websites reiterating it, and while my lazy ass could just plaster it on the screen for 30 seconds for you to read while I go take a piss break, I'm gonna go ahead and run it down for you. Thornton Jones was a lawyer living in Wales. On August 14th, 1924, he was pronounced dead and given a cause of death declaration of, I can't read it because of this website, I can't. Read this sentence aloud, even though I'm reading verbatim a historical document entirely relevant to what I'm talking about on a channel very clearly not made for kids, because otherwise I'm going to risk demonetization and being soft block on the website. So here's the article on the screen, and I'm just going to transliterate it as his death declared as self-game overing while temporarily insane. Somehow, Thornton had cut his own throat while he was dead asleep. He lived for 80 whole minutes before dying from the offending deed, during which time he motioned for a paper and pencil and wrote, I dreamt that I had done it, I awoke to find it true. That's fucked up. And it's also the same reason your mother and I had sex, except with the whole throat slitting thing, and also I wasn't asleep, and also she just asked. This one's super obvious and quick and really predictable, so let's just get it out of the way. Bobby Leach, inspired by Annie Taylor, who did it first, decided that he wanted to go over Niagara Falls in a steel barrel. And I'm sure you can imagine how that went. 
It went great and it gained him a ton of publicity. Then he died while on a publicity tour due to an infection he received after breaking his leg by slipping on an orange peel. I mean, that one's obvious, and if you didn't figure it out, you might just be fucking stupid, I don't know. Unfortunately, I now have to diminish the quality of this video. It is with great regret and sorrow that I have to report this next section will be about... Golf. You see that? That's my view counts plummeting for every second I talk about the sport made for businessmen to pretend that they're physically active. At least we can thank golf for one of two things. One, being the only source of sunlight-based vitamin D that most Republican senators ever get, and two, giving us the following story. Eben Byers won the 1906 U.S. Amateur Golf Tournament. Here come his golf stats on screen now! And again, I don't golf, so if any of you sports boys in the comments want to tell me if this is impressive or not, feel free. I'll be too busy not giving a shit because I don't want to spend a single second of my day thinking about golf. At some point, Eben took a nasty fall and injured his arm. Since he played golf, a sport for wimpy boys whose biggest lift is picking their wallet up off the ground, he cried and moaned about the pain day and night. His doctor said, hey, I got a great idea. You should start taking some Radithor. It's a medicine with radium in it. Its radioactive energy promotes your body's natural built-in energy system. You'll be healed in no time. Eben, being a big idiot, took the pills and thanked the doctor who maniacally rubbed his hands together and screamed, I'm rich, as soon as Eben walked out the door. It turns out the doctor who sold Eben this medicine was actually a scam artist who conned Radithor on people and pushed it in hospitals for a kickback percentage, but that's a tale for another day. Eben took a dose of Radithor and thought, wow, this is working great, I better take another. So of course he took another. And another, and another, and another, and another, and another, and over the course of a year he took, uh, you know, a handful of doses, a moderate amount of doses. He took about 1,400 doses of radioactive solution. Around this time in 1931, the Federal Trade Commission, or the FTC, the dudes who look at businesses and say, no, bad business, no, you can't do that, no, bad business, decided to step in on the whole thing and say, this dude sold you a vial that had what in it? The FTC asked if Eben could come testify for them to help them create new legislation around radioactive medicines. But Eben by this point was the fucking crypt keeper from the Tales from the Crypt. He sent a lawyer to go in his place and his lawyer's testimony was little more than explaining what the constant exposure to radium was doing to Eben. To directly quote Eben's lawyer, Mr. Byers' whole upper jaw, excepting two front teeth, and most of his lower jaw had been removed. Moved. All the remaining bone tissue of his body was disintegrating, and holes were actually forming in his skull. And you know what finally killed him? One of the dozens of cancers ravaging his body. The hospital declared that he had died of radiation poisoning and he was buried in a lead coffin, both to save anyone around his gravesite from exposure and to make sure his zombie didn't rise up to rampage through the society that had done him so much harm. The good news of this story is that his death led to the FTC basically banning Radithor from sale. The bad news is golf is still a sport today. Thomas Midgley Jr. was one of America's finest heroes for about 80 years. He helped develop both leaded gasoline and fluorocarbons, two substances that were largely banned in the 90s and 2000s because it turns out that stuff just tears the Earth's asshole in half with pollution. But we're not here to talk about Thomas Midgley Jr.'s pungent gas. We're here to talk about his goofy death contraption. Thomas got polio at the worst time possible, 1940, which was more than a decade before Jonas Salk invented the polio vaccine. Feel free to call Thomas an idiot. I'm personally personally saving my polio diagnosis for the year 2066 because that's when we'll invent an inside-out shrinking machine that'll let me go inside my own body and shoot all my polio with a really tiny machine gun. Since Thomas decided to get polio before we could realistically do a lot about it, he needed to take care of it personally. That's right, folks. Thomas devised a stupidly elaborate rope and pulley system in his bed so he could lift himself up to start the day. The homemade noose worked spectacularly, and he was found dead in his home. Home. Oh fuck, did I say homemade noose? 
Well, that's basically what it was. The system of ropes and pulleys did let him effectively get in and out of bed for about four years, but one day Thomas was found entangled and strangled within the mangled triangle of fangled new wranglers that jingle jangled his star spangled corpse. We're gonna go a bit out of order here because I only have two left on the list that I wanted to talk about, and I think the next one is by far the most fascinating. So we're gonna jump ahead to chronologically the last one on the list, and we're gonna cover Gareth Jones. Gareth Jones was an actor who was going to appear on Armchair Theater, a British television show that basically just broadcasted plays to people who wanted to eliminate the entire appeal of live theater so that they could see overacted performances in the comfort of their own home. Gareth was set to act in the play Underground, which is about a group of desperate, ravenous people arguing in the London city subways after a nuclear bomb detonation prevents them from going to the surface. Think of it like a biographical show about New York City, except with a nuclear bomb, more British people and somehow less cannibalism. Gareth told his fellow crew that he was feeling unwell once the play had began, and according to one nosy tattletale fellow actor, he was sipping on brandy backstage to help relax in preparation for his cue, to the point that he was passing out in his makeup chair. After a bit of the play had gone on, Gareth's time to shine was upon us. But all that came upon us, the mostly half-asleep audience watching in British homes back in 1958, was nothing. Gareth had disappeared, and now the theater performance had to devolve itself into an even worse form of theatrical entertainment. Improv. Gareth's character was supposed to arrive with information crucial to the scene, but since he was nowhere to be found, the actors on stage began to improvise their lines. During this mockery of the sacred house of thespians, Shakespeare's unholy ghost decided it was time to rain a hellfire punishment on Gareth for fucking everything up. Just as Gareth was finally making his way to the stage, he fell in the wings of the theater and didn't get up. The actors on stage were then instructed to keep the play going without him, and to keep improvising their way out of this mess. Meanwhile, the camera crew filming the entire debacle was told to film the show like a football match, which is soccer for anyone who speaks correct English. Now this is where things get goofy, as they tend to do when I get my grubby paws on something interesting. The first act of the play ended, and Gareth was dead. He had a heart attack and he was carted out of the theater by the crew that stays on hand in case there's any stage accidents to attend to. The improv continued, and characters filled in for Gareth's absence, even as rumors spread backstage that Gareth was totally dead as fuck and never coming back. So what's the real kicker here? What's this on the list for? And why is it in my video? Well, Gareth's character in the play was eventually going to die of a heart attack. Gareth was doubling down on his anxiety and alcoholism in a potentially brilliant untold story of method acting. Because his real world heart gave out an entire act before his character cardiovascular muscle was supposed to. The final death of this video is a mystery. It's a tale so perplexing that the quest to solve it worked its way all the way up to full-time cross-dresser and part-time FBI director J. Edgar Hoover. It's appropriate to call it the Dark Souls of Suspicious Deaths, because the Florida woman in question was labeled Cinder Lady. This is the story of Mary Reeser and how she somehow spontaneously fucking combusted. Pansy Carpenter was a heartless monster, a Satan worshiper, and a child murderer. For simplicity, we'll refer to her by her working title that summarizes her as all of those things. She was a landlady. Pansy went to Mary's apartment with a telegram at 8 a.m. on July 2nd, 1951. And as she tried to open the door, she went, Ow, hot. Ow, hot. Ow. Hot. Ah, hot. Oh. Mary's apartment was unreasonably warm for the midsummer Florida weather, registering 400 degrees Fahrenheit, which was a full five degrees hotter than the ambient temperature outside. Pansy called the police, who responded with, look, we'll look the other way about you being a landlady just this once because this story sounds interesting, but don't ever call us again. Upon entering the apartment, Pansy and the cops saw a chair in the middle of the room covered in Mary's remains, which by this point consisted mainly of ashes and, in the words of the fire inspector, her skull which had shrunken to the size of a teacup. Ooh, mystery! Well, we'll never know what happened in the end.
No, no, I'm just kidding. Life isn't nearly as cool as when you're allowed to just make shit up. Now, initially, no one knew what happened. People don't tend to just erupt into flames and full burn out unless they're not subscribed to my YouTube channel. And since I started making videos all the way back in 1938, I remember Mary was one of my devoted subscribers, so that couldn't have happened. The chief of police at the time, J.R. Reichert, gathered up a mountain of evidence from the scene and mailed it in a box to the FBI, specifically addressing it to Edgar. Hoover himself. He included a note that said, quote, Dear Mr. Hoover, this fire is too puzzling for the small town force to handle. Also, I've been a very good boy this year. Can I please have a red fire truck for Christmas? If you get me another yellow one, I will kill each and every person in my family. Love, Jangleton Rizimoso Reichert. And so the investigation was on. And it of course ruined all the fun and magic of the world because they had to rule things out and tell me what didn't happen. They ruled out that the electric grid in the room was unaffected, therefore a lightning strike was impossible. They also ruled out any third party combustibles like gasoline because they'd be detectable after the fire burn. After crossing out lots of potential causes on a whiteboard, including magic spells, extreme ironing, and fire type Bigfoot, they came to a pretty likely conclusion thanks to interviewing Mary's daughter-in-law. She randomly exploded out of nowhere. The end. Okay, okay, stop the video now if you want this to forever remain a mystery. I'm going to spoil what happened for you. Mary did two things that every woman on the planet did back in the 1940s and 50s. She smoked, and she took way too many sleeping pills. The day she was granted a title worthy of a Dark Souls boss, Mary had taken two sleeping pills and lit up a fat puffing stick. It's pretty easy to put two and two together by this point. Mary passed out, dropped her cigarette on her nightgown, and a combination of being really fucked up, overweight, and 67 years old meant that she was going to sit there and roast like the Christmas goose that she was. And there's lots of details that rule this as the likely chain of events. The floor of Mary's apartment was concrete, so it wasn't going to burn. And her position in the room was pretty much removed from everything else in the room. Since she was a little bit of a tobby lady, she experienced the wick effect, which is when the body's fat mixes with clothing and other things on it that keep flames on it burning for a long, long time. And that's the tale of that. Don't worry, I was disappointed too, especially when I learned what the wick effect is because I found out that it's not when Keanu Reeves kicks in your door and tactfully headshots everyone in your house. I'm only human. I have emotions too. And so concludes yet another entry in the saga of me laughing at people who aren't around to defend themselves. Join me next time when I'll fucking explode. <laughs>